trying to get several denominations to look at some kind of a federation, or whatever term you want to use, is really very difficult. Uh, I've been involved in a couple of those, and uh, you know, uh, breaking away from the denominational uh, orientation is really difficult. My, my brother was a Presbyterian minister, and he had, had said to me, you know, I don't know how you can operate in that federation. I'd never come there. My answer was very simple. I'd smile and say, we wouldn't have you. <laughs> <laughs> we've always been ahead of our time. We've come full circle with the ecumenical movement, which is, seems to be growing, being more accepting of other religions, and I think it's very hopeful uh, from the very beginning of the church and the way we go now. If you read the history books, you realize it wasn't always so easy. <laughs> and we came to some points where things almost didn't happen this way, but there always seemed to be enough strength in the Federation to pull it through and back to its roots. The Presbyterians and the Methodists have more in common than they have differences, and the uh, focus in this church, uh, not only being progressive, uh, but it was on the commonalities. Uh, in the denominations rather than the differences. Well, there was a time when the Methodist district superintendent decided that uh, we should abolish the federation and go
go one direction. Um, people here said there is no way that is going to happen and he wasn't a district superintendent much longer <laughs> after that. This was like a home church to me. So when we came in here the first Sunday, we arrived in Flagstaff, the family came here. We walked in here and it was so friendly and everybody, you know, we just felt so warm about the church. So everybody talked to us and, and we walked out and I said, this is our home church here. But I like it because it's all inclusive and that's the only kind of church I could be happy participating with. And then we were told, oh, you will want to join Federated Church. That's where all the important people go. <laughs> we didn't come for that reason. But. I had two reasons for joining the uh, church. One is it was the only Methodist church in town, and both my, my wife and I were uh, a strong Methodist background. And the other uh, is that it had the best music program in town. So we were singing in the choir within two weeks of when we arrived in town. Because I was asked to play the first year we moved here, I was delighted. And then I saw the organ. <clears throat> but I got along with it fine. I worked. Then the funny thing happened on that Sunday morning, and I still blush when I think of it, came to the Gloria. So I played through the Gloria, and nobody sang. <laughs> I was playing the wrong Gloria. There are two, and I played the wrong one. <laughs> well, if I could have climbed under the organ bench, I would have been happy. <laughs> Organ service at the age of 12. At that time, I was I was in my first year of organ study with Miss Abby. She was my first organ instructor. I credit her for the reason that I'm a good organist. So I've been playing a long time, off and on. And I think one of the reasons that this relationship is warm is the fact that every minister we have comments upon the fact that anything that is funny that does re uh, require a laughing response. I laugh the first in the last. Uh -huh, you catch and the joke. ministers <laughs> like me. When I came, Betty Lou was the organist. And she always, when there was a wedding, she always tried to wear a dress that matched the bride's um, colors. colors. Uh -huh. She had several dresses, and she always oh, had yeah. one to go with them. And it was always fancy and kind oh, of a yeah. nice touch. And in those days, there was no dancing allowed in the church. Dances that we did were folk things. Because folk things <laughs> were, might have been dancing, but we didn't use the term dancing. Those were folk games. At the west end of, of Reese Hall, uh, where some of the storage areas are, for the, yeah. Well, there were windows out of that, and that was a projection room up there. Yep, and the rest of it was a gym for, well, whatever the occasion was. See, like lots of churches have that now, uh, a multi-purpose room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we had it first. <laughs> <laughs> we had basketball, we had Boy Scouts, we had... Uh, the community affairs. It was really for a while. It was one of the halls where 
where you could gather a number of people before the war. We all believe firmly and strongly, I think, in allowing our facilities to be used by various groups in the community. And uh, we've been proud of that fact, that we've been willing to allow our church to be used for many different purposes and by de many different groups. Over the years, there was a big and thriving preschool here. Mm -hmm. And that served a need for quite some time. Well, and we were the f first and now the oldest Head Start program in yes. Flagstaff. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just makes you happy that we've been able to provide that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that makes me very proud is uh, during the Vietnam War situation, uh, we adopted a family that came from Vietnam and helped them get started in America. I would, I would bet that we serve as many different organizations in this church as, if not more, that as any in the community. People know this building um, and it ties to the past and has a rich tradition. Our members have over the years probably taken care of 90% of our the needs of our, on our physical uh, facility. And uh, Boy Scouts Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that everybody comes here and mm -hmm. uses the church. How many AA groups? I mm -hmm. can't count. That seems to me what a church building should be for. Yeah. I'm thinking of the scouts. You know, the too. scouts. Well, yeah. yeah. They've always used our buildings. Yeah, my girls mm -hmm. were in the Girl Scout program mm -hmm. here. And you look at the wall with the number of Eagle Scouts yes. that this troop has produced. Mm -hmm. It is truly amazing. That's right. And now with the new columbarium, we're all very happy that that yes. has gotten off the ground. Mm -hmm. It was very needed, I think, for our community. Well, the Jewish congregation met here. That's the Buddhists right. have That's met right. here. I've forgotten that. The um, Jewish congregation. Very strong with the 12 step programs. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that makes me proud. We've always had a big draw from the, probably more than we do now, from the university. Lots of people in town would call this the university church. They thought that's where all the people go. Of course, they didn't, but a good, lots of them did. In the uh, mid-60s, uh, several of us from this church became aware uh, of a need for uh, something on the campus. So we uh, got a campus ministry started. We got uh, together with the Lutherans uh, the Episcopalians and the American Baptists and built what is presently uh, the Campus Ministry Center. My kids loved youth group. In fact, uh, Rachel Neatman and Grace were in love with Matt Kendall and he was the leader of the youth group, so they could hardly wait till Sunday evening <laughs> to come, you know, and, and, uh, the, and the boys liked it too, but they, not for the same reasons. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, the kids sold Christmas trees for years and years oh, and years yes. and years. Well, we From and Connie play. Haynes, yeah. Connie and Lamar Haynes. Yeah, or, yeah Lamar, who started Camp Colton. The house that the youth had been using uh, for their activities uh, no longer was uh, functional uh, and we built then this addition. The idea was uh, this floor uh, or in the room where we are would be the junior high room and kind of a, a social uh, meeting room and the second floor would be the, the youth room. We did have the manse, which was a stone building, 
and they said it wasn't safe, it needed to come down and they had to build, bring a steel wrecking ball in to knock it down. And that's how sturdy it was. There were, there were two houses uh, on this property uh, along with the, the uh, sanctuary and all three of them used the red stone. Uh, when those houses were torn down, the red stones were kept and they've come in very handy uh, <laughs> for repair work. I look at the Christian education. Right away I became involved in teaching Sunday school. And there was a delightful lady years ago who was uh, the Sunday school superintendent. Her name was Pearl Merriman. And I said to her, Pearl, I would like to teach Sunday school. And she said, well, well, she kind of interviewed me, so she let me start, <laughs> and she came in and witnessed that I was capable, which was so nice for her. <laughs> she was just sincere, <laughs> totally sincere. Anyhow, I love the church because of what it has done for Christian education. We had lots of kids, and we had at least 75 at the Bible school in the summertime. The kids would do a lot more with the, with the uh, seasons of the year which I really thought was just wonderful with their growing up, you know, that they saw the year as a, a year of seasons in the church year. Well, the head of Sunday school was Ibernia Tyson. Okay. Really neat lady, mm -hmm. great sense of humor. There was one woman, Mrs. Priest, who was English, and she was in charge of teaching all the mid-grade students. And to this day, I'll recently, when we do the Lord's Prayer Church, I'll still repeat, say it the way I learned it, which was out of the King James, Our Father, which, mm -hmm. and forever and ever. Mm -hmm. And I've had my pastor look around going, you know, there's only one, not the way I learned it. <laughs> Again, times change. People say they can't get teachers. I don't know, there would just be people that would be waiting to be asked. And we'd have at least two teachers in a class, you know, yeah. class, the room would be filled. But we didn't have much adult education. We had the adult Bible class. Well, Tish Osmond came and, and changed that. She got the adult education going in this church. Said, of course you have, because if you only have a, a dozen people in the adult Bible class, who else is waiting for another kind of class? You know, another kind of Sunday morning class. So. She just went right at it. Another tradition we always had was not seasonal, but what well, was seasonal, but not Christmas, was the, the bazaar. All the circles. We had Martha Circle, what, what, I don't know all the names. I was in Martha Circle. And we'd get together and have work days, and we'd make all these crafts. And then have it. everybody from the community came and Reese Hall. We had stuff spread out all over the place. And that was a money raiser. And, and it was quite the big deal. We had three or four circles, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, Martha met in the morning, but it was all us women who stayed home with the kids. We hadn't gone back to work yet. Mm -hmm. And the evening group was for those who did go to work yeah. and seemed to want, to want one more thing to do <laughs> besides working. It hasn't been a very easy church to be a pastor in because oh. I think <coughs> it has been difficult to please everyone. It takes a, a, a person with an open mind that can see good in other approaches and it takes a fairly flexible person uh, because they, the minister really needs to be able to uh, function in both the Methodist and the Presbyterian uh, governmental uh, uh, system. Uh, I think uh, we gain vitality yes. because we have pastors uh, uh, leaving and new pastors mm -hmm. coming. Mm -hmm. And when Travis Kendall was here, he took the youth down the canyon, took them on many, many trips and they have never forgotten. It's p almost part of their religious experience. Oh, he was, he was uh, very much uh, a youth person. He would take the kids on um, the San Juan River, 
you know, for river trips. And his wife, Janet, uh, was the uh, epitome of the perfect minister's wife. Oh, She was no. to every, back then we had circles. She went no. to every circle meeting. She was in this church in the front pew, those services every Sunday. I mean, she spread herself everywhere. Early. She was the old fashioned epitome. Yes. This church has also launched uh, a number of people to go into the ministry. That's true. Yes. And I Good think of point. Dave Devereaux and Hamilton. Marie Ray and you know, various yeah. people. I don't know of very many churches that have a history either. No. Uh, we have uh, actually two. Uh, Garland Downham, who was a history professor, uh, wrote the longer one and the original one. And then Bill Lyon, also in the history department, has brought that up to date. My, my parents, my grandparents, call me Ricky. Well, my grandparents would do that. And Miss Tinsley. Okay. She's the only one that could get away with it. <laughs> and um, she was in charge of landscaping at Federated after she'd retired. And she'd call me up one time and said, uh, Ricky, we're going to be. Uh, Plan, plants around the church. Here's your, here's your plot over here. I said, yes, ma'am, when am I supposed to be there? <laughs> See, you, you, know, so you didn't say no to Aunt Hensley. Ardine and Dorothy Olson oh, yes. were the epitome. Oh, yes. Dorothy, Dorothy, Dorothy the would the tell Christian stories. life. <laughs> they yeah. did. If you ever want to aspire, you just think of yeah. those two ladies and try because they, they just, were just, just unbelievable. Well, and our hymn books in the pews mm -hmm. are a result of our Dean Frederick. Yes. She mounted a campaign and got the contributions, and mm -hmm. I believe she was responsible for the Bibles in the pews, and that all <laughs> was our Dean. Of course, we remember Dr. Frosky, who was uh, very, very early on, his pictures in Reese Hall, and uh, he sat right back, sat right back there the with his special pillow, like Betty Lou pew. used to some years that later. Yeah, and of course, true. his office was just right across the street, that corner house on uh, Aspen. Yes, he was an amazing man. He came he here to be a hundred. Yes. He came here because he was suffering from tuberculosis <laughs> and he was supposed to come here for his health. He came out here to die. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. It took him a while. <laughs> Dr. Fronsky had already finished his medical education and was practicing back in the, med in the East and came out here for the health reasons. But for many years, he was the doctor in town. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anybody else. I had to have my tonsils out, and Dr. Frosky did it. But it was outpatient, because I can remember it was snowing. Mom took me home, got down the steps in the car, and I remember Dr. Frosky says, make sure he gets all the ice cream he wants. And did you? Yeah. All right. <laughs>A friend once asked Dr. Fronsky, why do you come to church when your vision and your hearing are not good? His reply, I want people to know where I stand. Lola Allen. I feel very hopeful. I see a vitality and it's contemporary and it seems to reach the children and I think it will continue to grow that way. I really like the way the church is progressing.
I leave a message with you, it is that the church is an important place for each of us. It is a place for us to grow as a people and to serve God. God loves each of us, and because we love Him, we should love one another and serve. Elna Mangus